Hi everybody. Um, today we're going to be learning about the spread of Protestantism. So if you've been following along, we've taken a look at how Luther got the whole thing started. And so this is a little bit more about how that movement that he started spread. We're going to start off with, with a group called the Anabaptists. Now the Anabaptists were kind of a voluntary uh, group of people who came together um, who really didn't have any connection or allegiance to any state. So in other words, they're, they're not sort of tied to one country that they, that they want to uh, change, but they're sort of, uh, they're sort of going to span countries. The, they have a couple of big things that, that they talk for. Number one is the idea of adult baptism, which, which they, they feel that people need to make a choice in this uh, religious thing. Do they want to be a part of this um, religion or do they not? To baptize children, they say, is a little bit ridiculous because children can't make this choice for themselves. And they really did believe that the end of the world was near, as have many groups throughout history. And so they needed to prepare themselves for the final judgment and make sure that they were doing the right thing and all of that. Now, as a matter of, um, as a matter of uh, doctrine, they did kind of reject the Trinity the idea that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all one um, and that they're all going to sort of, you know, that they're all together. Now, it's Munster that becomes really sort of their stronghold. And you have these, these group, and I want to make this very clear. These are radical Anabaptists, okay? In any group, you have your sort of conservatives, the people who are more concerned about doctrine, maybe, more concerned about ideas, and radicals who are more concerned typically with actions and pretty extreme actions. So they took control of the city, and from 1509 to 1536, right here, uh, they had control. They're led by a guy named Joseph, uh, or sorry, John of, of Leiden, um, and they do a whole bunch of things inside of Munster in order to sort of push their Anabaptist ways. They institute polygamy, um, they allow women to become part of the, uh, of the movement there, and they burn, they burn all the books except the Bible, which they said is the only thing that people should be reading. Um, they murdered a lot of Lutherans and Catholics, and here is where things get a little bit ugly, um, and so this caused a reaction. Um, and uh, you have this sort of reaction by the Protestant and Catholic armies who go through and they capture the city um, and they execute a whole lot of Anabaptist leaders um, and, and uh, Anabaptists. Now, Anabaptists did not go away. Um, there are some descendants of them. Um, Mennonites uh, are here. Um, they typically uh, are going to be uh, coming out of, uh, out of Dutch leaders, um, and pacifism is big uh, with, with the Mennonites. Um, Quakers come out there a lot like Mennonites, um, although they tend to be English. And, and they do come to America largely, and at least initially, in the colonies of Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. Um, and then you have the uh, Unitarians who come there. They're sort of influenced by Anabaptists, but they reject the Trinity and just see sort of uh, one God, and that's it. There's also a, re a reformation that goes on in uh, Switzerland. It starts off around this guy right here, who is Ulrich Zwingli, um, who starts looking at Erasmus's translation of the New Testament and decides that maybe what they need to do is they need to establish sort of a perfect society on earth. And they do so, he does so, in the town of Zurich inside of uh, what is now Switzerland. Um, and and made a couple of points. Number one, the only authority is the Bible. This doesn't really change from what Luther had said, but he goes on to form, say something which is really uh, anti-Lutheran, which is that the Eucharist or the, uh, or the communion is a purely symbolic move, that there's nothing really going on, that the, the bread and wine of communion do not physically become the body and blood of Christ, but it's just a symbol. Um, and this is what causes a split with Luther. Um, and at the colloquy of Marburg, um, there's, there's this official split because they don't agree on the idea of the Eucharist. Um, and so when they come out in Augsburg um, and, and, and they, they come to a peace, um, the, the Zwinglians are left out of it altogether. 
Perhaps the biggest and most influential reformer during the Protestant Reformation is this guy right here, John Calvin. Um, he's, he's born in France. He ends up uh, getting exiled. Like Luther, he starts off, starts off as a lawyer, um, but he's exiled. He goes to Switzerland. While he's in Switzerland, he writes perhaps the most influential book about Protestantism at the time, at least, the Institutes of the Christian Religion. And this sets out an organized way to uh, practice Protestantism. Um, now, the big thing that he's known for is the idea of predestination, that God is an all-knowing, omniscient, omnipotent being, can see future as well as past as well as present. And therefore, he already knows before people are born whether they're going to be saved or not. Now, there are a whole lot of questions on this, and I don't want to get into the ins and outs of predestination and its impact on free will and all of that. Um, you can certainly uh, Google it, or, or you can watch a couple of videos um, about that one. Um, but the idea is that there's this group called the elect, um, and these are church members who've really had a conversion experience that, that, that God has sent. And, and when they do that, they show that they've been converted because they sort of act very godly. So in practice, how, what do you do with this whole idea of predestination? Well, again, in Switzerland, much like Zwingli, he establishes a theocracy, a rule by uh, church leaders, but this time it's in the city of Geneva. Um, and you have a whole bunch of people who are coming here because they, they like, wow, this is a great place to be because we're, we're going to practice and we're being exiled from other places, so let's go. As other, as other states become a little bit more tolerant, they're going to take those beliefs back um, to their homes. And anyway, the whole idea is enforcing Christian behavior. And so you combine the church and the city, in other words, church and government together in order to enforce this way of living, which is holy. Um, that you have to be committed, you had to be committed to live there. And, and there are very harsh penalties for not following laws. And we could get into a lot of these, but the idea is that you want to, that you want to take, or that Calvin wanted to take away the earthly temptations for the elect to go against their election. Um, again, the, 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 the details of the predestination thing get a little muddy around here. Um, descendants of Calvin, it spreads everywhere. In Scotland, uh, you have Presbyterianism, um, which is established there. The change here is that the church is actually run by the people who are known as preps, presbyters, uh, presbyters, sorry. And uh, this becomes the dominant Scottish religion. Um, and this is going to cause some problems uh, when the... Um, when the uh, the Scottish and the English come together, um, second group that that you might want to know about is the Huguenots who are in France. Um, they are living in a very Catholic country, um, so they're brutally repressed. But because of the rebellion, because the nobility is seeing their power taken away, at least that's part of the reason um, by the French king, um, they really sort of. Uh, swing towards this Calvinist idea as a rebellious uh, uh, move. Uh, number three, you have the Dutch Reformed Church, which which uh, r arises in what's now known as the Netherlands, and this is a way of revolting against again against centralized authority. This, um, in this case, it's it's the domination of Spain who owned this area. Um, and so Philip II, as the, as the king of Spain there, it was, was a rebellion against them. Um, in 1581, they actually declare their independence uh, largely as a move towards this. Um, and then in England, you have your Puritans um, who have very strict adherence to Christian ideals. Um, they really restrict personal behavior in all of this. Um, of course, they come to the uh, they, they come to the colonies and establish some colonies in America. Um, and when the English Civil War comes out, they actually end up winning it until you know the Restoration. So they're in. Wow. And then yes, we have the Anglican Church, which is becomes the main force in England, largely because this guy wants a divorce from his wife, and the Pope denied it. Um, you, I have a video on 
the English Reformation, which goes into more detail here. Um, but uh, but yeah, the Pope denied the divorce, the divorce, and so Henry broke broke from the church and established his own religion. Um, very importantly, he closed down all the monasteries throughout England and took all of the wealth and the land that they owned in order to consolidate his own power. But while he was alive, most Catholic practices are maintained, and Anglicanism. This is Anglican, by the way. My students love to call it Angelican or something like that. Anglican being uh, an adjective that is the same as English. Um, maintain most of their practices. Um, now he dies, and so the story should at least quickly be told here. Um, his successor is uh, Edward VI, who's the son of his third wife of six, um, and, and really moves things towards Calvinism. So things become a little bit more, a little bit less Catholic, um, and a little bit more Calvinist in their, in their, uh, in, in their look in the Anglican church, but he's a sickly kid. Um, he dies at age 16 and he's succeeded by his sister, Mary Tudor, who's the daughter of the first wife of Henry VIII, Catherine of Aragon. And she, uh, being a, uh, Spanish woman was Catholic, um, and so her, her, her daughter, not being very happy about how her wife, her mother was treated, uh, completely pulls back on the regis, on the Reformation, um, ends up killing about 300 or so leaders of the Protestant, uh, reformers who had been sort of these Calvinist guys. And you have a lot of Protestants who flee England because they're scared of, of getting killed, but she does forever earn the name bloody Mary. The Tudor dynasty ends with Elizabeth I, one of the most popular English monarchs of all time, who's the daughter of Anne Boleyn, who's Henry VIII's second wife, um, the, the last of his children to take the throne. And here is where Protestantism really takes hold in, uh, in England in a really big way. Um, there is a major move here, though. Um, in that this, she allows for a degree of religious tolerance. Other groups, including Catholics, can practice their religions within England, even though the Anglican Church is the established Church of England, but it has to be done in private, and it can in no way uh, be outwardly demonstrated or interfere with their uh, with their adherence to English law and all of that. It's this move, um, and, and, and she uh, is described by historians as one of a group of politiques, which is uh, something we'll go into, but it, the, these are rulers who put the, the state above the religion at this time and becomes very successful because she has a very long and successful reign as queen, but dies uh, without an heir because she never gets married, uh, and has, never has any children, leading to uh, some state problems that we'll talk about later. So that's about where I'm going to stop here, um, and um, I hope that kind of uh, helps you understand the spread of the Protestant Reformation so that uh, you can do well on your test.